All right. So we came up with a pretty, uh, I'm gonna see it. Uh, simple experiment that we do often in the lab, and today we're gonna try to do it with all of you. Now, what you should know about me right away is that uh, my clocks are very different than yours in the sense that I speak super fast. Uh, some of you already got it. I know that Tim from the back is gonna signal to me to slow down every now and then, but feel free to at any point raise your hands and say slow down yourself. So we're gonna look at my clocks and your clocks in the following way. I have a phone in my hand and you have in front of you a piece of paper with the Rubin Museum, uh, exactly, you see that? And you're supposed to have pencils next to you. So we ask you to do the following. First of all, on the top of the paper, write your gender. And now we're gonna have the following thing. You see that in the bottom, there are three lines that are empty. I'm going to start my stopwatch here, and I'm going to let it run for a few seconds. Now you would not know how long it will be. Five seconds, 10 seconds, 50 seconds. I'm gonna run it, and I'm gonna say stop at some point, and I ask each of you to write in the top row how long you think it has been. How many seconds you think passed from the moment I said start to the moment I said stop? We're gonna do it three times. Start, stop, you're gonna write a number. Start, stop, you're gonna write a number. And a third time, start, stop, and you're gonna pick a number. When you're done, you're gonna fold a piece of paper and pass it to the back where Chris sits. Raise your hand, Chris. He's gonna take all of your uh, papers and he is gonna tally the numbers and he's going to tell us a few things about you. First of all, he's gonna tell us who uh, was the most accurate in all the three trials, who was the person who was closest to the right time, which I'll tell you after we're done. Then he's gonna also tell us who did better as a group, men, women. Then he's gonna also uh, tell us who the winner is, who gets the Valentine's Day tickets. <laughs> and uh, if you want, feel free to also put your age, and he's gonna tell us something about the age groups that did well. Okay, everyone's ready? You all put your name, you all put your gender. So I'm gonna uh, say start, I'm gonna lower my hand, count the time in your mind, and when I say stop, write a number. Ready, three, two, start. Second trial, three, two, one, start. Stop. Last one. Three, two, one, start. Stop. All right, put your names and let's pass them to the back and we're gonna tell you the results, oh, to the side. Yeah. And we're gonna give you the results. <laughs> oh. 
Once we clear them, I'm going to tell you all. We all get rid of them? I think so, if you can. All right. So now uh, I'm going to invite Whitney, who is an expert in timing. <laughs> Please join me. Thank you. Oh. The answers were, I'm telling you before so you can tell me how good you did without the uh, embarrassing. Were you guys all counting? I was just counting. Am I a cheating, awful lady? I think everyone counted. It's I'm just monster. really, really hard to count. Oh, got it. I didn't know if I was supposed to just be like, how much time was that if I was allowed to count? Did everybody count? I'm just curious. Yes? OK, good. OK, got it. So most of you probably counted, and most of you just counted Mississippi, right? That's the standard one uh, that you all used. And uh, if you did that, you probably are, uh, if you're a man, you're a little bit shorter than the times. And if you're a woman, you're a little bit overshooting. The answers were 23 seconds for the first one, 38 seconds for the second one, and 16 seconds for the third one. <laughs> and what we learned from that is that it's really, really hard to know the time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Totally. So. Let's talk about... Who is coming here for Valentine's <laughs> Day? I have to know. We're going to get soon the answers. Chris? Okay, yes, perfect. Okay. So, we're here to talk about time, the brain, yep. the female brain, your movie. Yes. What made you make this film? Can I be super clear really quickly? I... Talking to a neuroscientist about science is my literal nightmare. <laughs> this is my, I'm living my nightmare right now. <laughs> I'm a comedian. I know nothing about science. I was really passionate about making this into a movie because I felt like a scientist probably didn't have time to do something this ridiculous. Uh, so this is very intimidating. I am sweating. Um, <laughs> But uh, what was your question? I'm too nervous to answer. <laughs> you answered, I think, the question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what made you make a movie about the female brain? So I, has anyone read the book, The Female Brain, by any chance? You read it, one person? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, I think you said, too. I, what started happening to me is, I don't know if anyone ever, um, when you go on Amazon and you buy things and they start suggesting purchases <laughs> to you, and sometimes they're sort of insulting. Uh, like if you, I, I noticed that when I like order too much like makeup or like self tan, they're start suggesting like self help books and like self esteem books. I'm like, how did you get? What's this algorithm? Um, but two of my parents, two of my parents, my parents, um, <laughs> I have many parents, uh, had strokes when I was younger, when I was in my late 20s, and I had to all of a sudden talk to neurologists in an ICU, and they're talking about all these, you know, you know, neuroscientists. They assume everyone is as smart as they are. And, uh, and they would talk with these really um, specific terms, and I had no idea what this. So I just started buying books online about neurology, and then the female brain finally came up, and it was just kept coming up and kept coming up, and I kept resisting it. And I was like, why? Oh, because I think science is boring. Where did that come from? That's, re that's a crazy um, stereotype. Why wouldn't I want to read a man about how the most important thing in my body works, and I read it, and I could not put it down. I felt such an overwhelming sense of relief um, because the way that, that it was framed was that all these stereotypical qualities about women and men um, were actually posed as strengths. You know, I think I, I just heard so much, like you hear all the time these stereotypes, women are crazy, right? Women are psychos. Like this is something that is just said that's socially acceptable to say. You're laughing. I'm um, not sure why, but I feel like there's a story behind that. Um, and, uh, but when I would press men, you know, every, you go on a date, every guy's always like, well, my ex is crazy. My ex is crazy, right? And then you're like, well, what, why? why? Why is she crazy? Uh-oh, uh-oh, what's happening? You said the wrong word. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> is that like Pavlov's dog? I get like, like electrocuted if I say a neurology word wrong. Um, and then you ask them, why, what, why is your ex crazy? And they're like, oh, she like called me a million times to get like the keys to the house. And you're like, <laughs> Well, she probably needed the keys to the house. Why didn't you give her the keys? You know, she's a psycho. She's a stalker. I'm like, well, didn't she live there? I don't think she's stalking you. I think she lives there. And then I just got very fascinated by this social construct that women are crazy and men are stupid, which I think is really reductive and unfair and sexist to everyone. And 
I'm being boring, but the, the book sort of uh, posed women being sensitive, emotional, hypervigilant as superpowers instead of as weaknesses. And I thought that was super interesting and worth trying to get into the zeitgeist. There's a saying among scientists, uh, they say it's not research, it's me search. So that's, a, that's, that's how a, you started the answer. You figure out that you can answer your questions about life by making a movie about that. That's fascinating. And that's actually what the scientist in the movie that I play was trying to, she was um, doing research uh, about men and women's brains and she wasn't, she didn't like her results. So she kept doing the study over and over again <laughs> because <laughs> she was, she doesn't, she just rejected this idea because she was worried that this might, and I was really worried going into making this movie, like, could this be regressive? Like the idea that men and women are different in gender, like it felt like it could be a sexist territory. So I was actually very worried Read, but I think ultimately it became about what's nature and what's nurture. So, so what did you learn? Tell me what did you learn when you started making the movie about the brain that was interesting for you? Um, I, facts, fun facts. I learned a couple things. I learned that I didn't know this, that neuro the field of neurology is quite new, right? All of mm -hmm. this information is pretty, we know it pretty recently. Yeah. Am I right on that? And there was a couple things in the movie that um, the neurologist that wrote the book was like, oh, since that came out, that's not true anymore. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like science can change? Like this is a crazy concept or things keep updating. Is that true? Definitely. Since we started, there's already new results. Since we started this yeah. conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, I didn't realize science was like fluid or, you know, it's just as, as I guess the technology gets better to look into the brain, you know, so it, I, that was something that was very fascinating to me. So there's a couple things we sort of took out because I was worried that they might not, that in like five years, this movie is going to be a fiction movie. It's basically <laughs> going to be like Star Wars or something. <laughs> um, that was fascinating to me. Um, there's a beautiful quote that I like on a graffiti that I saw once. It says, the only difference between science fiction and science is timing, which is a... That's genius. That is very is, genius. Wait long enough, you're gonna find proof for everything that the science fiction suggests. So we're good. Anyhow, I stopped you from talking about like what you learned, which is Something the most else I learned is that scientists and neurologists are human beings. <laughs> Isn't that a weird concept? <laughs> Like they're human beings and they can get hungry and they can get tired and they can like have a bad day. Does that ever impact or are you just a robot? As we speak, I'm also sweaty and nervous as you are. Good, so that, that makes me feel way better. <laughs> like, cause I just, it occurred to me, it's like I'm a comedian, if I have a bad day, like nobody cares. But like the idea that you're like using needles, I don't even know really exactly what you do. <laughs> Use needles. I just picture just, you putting needles into people's heads all day. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you something that uh, registers so in my work, I often see patients, that's part of the work. And, and I remember the first day, this is now nine years ago, where I went to the operating room to see a patient with open brain. And it's like a long corridor and you walk and at the end there's a person whose brain is about to be open and you're gonna put electrodes inside his head. And I remember this feeling and I told myself that I know that it, it's, it's a shocking feeling, right? You're gonna open someone's brain and look inside. And I also knew that if I do it, enough times it's gonna become natural and I would forget this feeling and I promised myself that I'm gonna to try to remember this feeling of fear that you experienced the first time you did it and recreate it every time I go to see a patient. And since then for nine years, every time I walk to the corridor, I tell myself, remember this first time where your hands were shaking and you were nervous and f really, really worried that you're gonna see someone's brain. And I think this is something that a lot of scientists forget because you start kind of getting used. Oh, yeah, electrodes. What, what? What do I have to for dinner tonight? Let's put electrodes mm -hmm. here. I think after. I think this is this is the beauty of like of getting used to things. At the same time, this is the thing that you have to preserve as scientists because it's quickly something that you can forget. Like you can get desensitized yeah. to the fact that there's a person and his or her brain is in your hands right now. Didn't is that <laughs> stressful to anyone else? <laughs> Like what is that? Like I can't, I can't even, I can't even. I, I, looking at like brain scans, I was overwhelmed and and. Uh, so let's talk about that. In your film, there was a lot of. Were any of them brains. wrong? No, no. Are you sure? Yes, because you were safe. You didn't really show the inside. You just kind of showed the outside of a brain. There was a couple of brain scans because the way that you, I don't. Are there any filmmakers in the audience? Any filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers? Smart. It's very smart people. <laughs> um, so later, I wanted to put some brain footage in it, like some of that. It's we call it B-roll or stock footage or something in the beginning, and I picked all these ones because they were really pretty. And then later, I sent it to the neurologist, and she was like, "Those are mouse brains." And I was like, "Oh shit." <laughs> 
And I was like, but they're so pretty. And she's like, you cannot put those in the movie. Uh, one of them had some like horrible disorder, like it was some terrible thing. And she's like, this is gonna bum people out, like you can't. So, you know, it's, it was just hard for me to tell. So how did you do it? So you actually went to a, a computer graphic person, told him make pictures of the brain and it's gonna run it by I was literally Googling brain scans and pulling them off the internet and then <laughs> buying them on stock footage sites. Like it was, you know, it was, it's making independent movie is incredibly arduous and you really kind of have to do everything yourself and nobody cares as much as you do. And, you know, so I was, I was really just pulling it all myself and uh, trying not to get it wrong and constantly just asking the neurologist who wrote the book and her arguing with her over like the pretty one or the accurate one. And, <laughs> and we ended up, of course, using the accurate ones. It looks good. Good, thank you. Uh, I, I try to look at a few of them to see if it's accurate and they work. So. And I think that it was also particularly hard. Like I, you know, I, I unapologetically, I wanted to make a neurology comedy. I, I felt so, I was angry, I think, um, for lack of a better word, that neurology isn't taught like in high schools. Like I can't believe, there was just so much stuff my whole life, I was telling him earlier, I've had migraines my whole life. Um, I had some childhood trauma. Uh, I talk in the movie about epigenetic imprinting. I don't know if this is something you're, Let's go there. If I'm wrong, please <laughs> do not tell me in front of all these people. You hold it and you tell me backstage. I'm joking. Please correct me if I'm wrong about this. But um, I grew up in a very stressful home, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to, a dysfunctional home. And I learned, um, I finally found this therapist who was explaining to me that there's something called epigenetic imprinting, which is when you're in utero, the neurochemicals that your mother produces, you become addicted to in the womb, the same way like a crack baby is addicted to crack. I was probably born addicted to adrenaline because my mom was you know, always fighting with my dad and it was a crazy environment. And I always found myself gravitating towards stressful, dramatic situations, no matter how hard I tried to avoid them my whole life. And it's almost like I found this way to recreate my childhood circumstances and get adrenaline somehow. You know those people who were like, I hate drama, but they're always in drama? <laughs> that was like me. I was just like subconsciously just dating drug addicts and like, oh, he's gonna get a divorce, I swear. I mean, I was always <laughs> in some dramatic situation. And then she explained to me, adrenaline turns into dopamine. So it's actually kind of a drug. Generally, we know a lot more about addiction right now than we did a few years ago. And what we're learning is that A, a lot of things beyond substances are addictive. Mm -hmm. So we used to think, okay, alcohol is addictive and many, many substances. Now we're beginning to see that a lot of chemicals that people have naturally in their body, like adrenaline, like serotonin, like things like that could, with a little bit of a nudge, become very addictive. And even things that we didn't think of as chemicals become addictive. So mobile phones. Uh, yeah. There's now more and more evidence that they are equally addictive like gambling and like other things that actually create reward systems. So I think we're beginning to understand that addiction is almost hard, it's really hard to avoid. There's all the w obstacles in the world that try to make us addictive to things and we have to really fight hard. Do you think in 20 years there will be rehabs for cell phone use? Less. I would like for there to be, because I need to go. <laughs> I think it's gonna take less than 20 years. I, I feel like I'm- Oh, less is, than 20 years. Yes, I think that, they, I think that uh, you know, when I was a kid, there was this famous uh, picture of the CEOs of the tobacco companies kind of standing and uh, testifying in Congress and saying that we did not know that it was addictive. Yeah. I think you're gonna see the CEO of Facebook, Google, Amazon, Wow. And Twitter in the same lineup in a few months, years, saying the same thing. We didn't know it's addictive, and then they're gonna poke inside and they realize that actually they knew exactly what they're doing and it was all addiction. Half of my students, uh, when they finished their PhD, half, there's only been three, but three out of six. <laughs> uh, uh, it's like uh, I have, you have two parents and I have three students. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, but three of my students uh, went to become scientists and they're now doing great work in science and three of them went to work for Facebook and what they're doing right now is applying the same things we used to do in the lab to understand how the brain works to make you watch more cat videos. And, uh, how works. crazy is that? That's cra it's crazy to me. I mean, I live in Los Angeles and I was driving on the 405, very big freeway and I reached over and I picked it up and I was just like, I'm texting on a freeway. I, pick, I, I felt like I had no control over it and I was just sitting there and I was like, don't text, don't text. And it just was like this pull that felt like it was bigger than me. And I was like, this is terrifying. And, it, I, and it, please correct me if I'm wrong, but in a nice way, um, <laughs> that addiction is defined as um, doing the same thing despite negative consequences, right? Just is, that, <laughs> is that right? Yes. To continue to do a behavior despite negative consequences yeah. is one, know, yeah. one definition that sort of works for me. And I'm like, I go on this Instagram and it makes me feel bad. It makes me feel bad about myself. It makes me feel left out. And then I keep doing it. I just cannot stop. And that really scares me. In reading the research about young people doing it, I'm so glad I didn't have that when I was in high school. So 
You made a movie that people are going to watch. They won't listen to my lectures, but they would watch your movie. <laughs> what's, your, what's your aim with this film? Do you hope that people are going to learn about their brain? Do you, want, do you hope that they're going to enjoy? Do you hope that they're going to actually change something about their behavior? What do you, what's success? I think for me, like I had, a, again, really a, an unapologetic motive of like I wanted to figure out a way to make science digestible to people and to make neurology something that like kids or busy people that don't want to feel like they're If someone said to me, oh, there's a documentary on the brain on Netflix, let's watch like, eh, okay. But like if you put Sofia Vergara and Cecily Strong from Saturday Night Live and Blake Griffin, who's an athlete, I really just tried to um, candy coat it so that people would be interested in watching it and to sort of hide a science movie in a funny um, exterior to trick people into wanting to see a science movie, basically. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> And I also, you know, there's this thing, I don't know if anyone's in, in my field, but in Hollywood there's this um, sort of uh, stereotype that's thrown around a lot. A lot of executives say like, well, audiences are stupid. Audiences are stupid, that's too smart for them. You have to dumb it down. There's a lot of that. And I do not think audiences are stupid. You guys all showed up to a neurology lecture on a Thursday night, or is Thursday? I don't have a concept of time. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't think so. And I, I love watching TED Talks. I get into sort of wormholes on TED Talks and there's the one on the brain where the woman's holding the brain and it's got 45 million views. And I'm like, that's bigger than any studio movie. That's bigger than Star Wars. That's but people want to learn about this stuff. There's just, a, we're not, Hollywood's not making it, you know? And uh, so I was just like, nobody's going to make a movie called The Female Brain. Certainly not a business, you know, that, you know, two years ago certainly was uh, run by men. So I guess I'm just going to have to take matters into my own hands and, and do this. Um, and I, and I, I think that sometimes when I try to make something, I try to go like, what do I wish was available? And let me just make it. Or what do I wish was out there for, you know, I wish this movie was available to me when I was 20. It would have saved me a lot of bad relationships and Xanax and uh, <laughs> feeling bad about myself. And, um, you know, I think that to make something, to make an independent movie is so hard. You have to have such a crazy obsession with justice in order to push across the finish line. Let's talk about it. Tell me about the movie a little bit. How did you get the actors? How did you, I mean, you also directed the film and acted in it. I never understood how it's done. How do you actually say action and then run? And, <laughs> uh, uh, and like be in the yeah, it's, um, it's a nightmare. I mean, it's, it's very hard. I, I, you know, I just, I, I don't like it when people pretend things are easier than they are because then, you know, it, I, 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 nobody told me how hard it was to make an independent movie. I wish people were really blunt with me about it. It's difficult. I also think because of this social construct of women being bosses is, is hard. It was hard for me personally because telling people what to do, I always felt like I was like, sorry, I don't wanna hurt your feelings. You know, there was a lot of that, which I read about in the book that we tend to be wired for consensus. We can override that if we have enough adrenaline and if our childhood went look at you. well enough. Look at me, I, I, I am nervous. Um, and, uh, you know, but it is a struggle for me to disagree with people. And, it's a, and when you're directing a movie, you're asked 50 questions a minute and you have to say no constantly and you're hurting people's feelings, you're upsetting them, you're turning into their ex-wife that they hate, their mother that ignored them, their father that disapproved of them, they're projecting all kinds of shit on you, everybody's pissed off and you have to tolerate the discomfort of a lot of people, which was a struggle for me personally. And um, so yelling action, going on camera, you know, I just, I just kind of, did, I blacked out for most of it, which actually I think helped. This is a weird little thing that I actually have not talked about with anyone. The character, I wanted to make sure, the only reason I played the part, because I was too worried about hiring a funny actress and having to tell her to be less funny, no offense, but I just figured neuroscientists weren't, like, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you? You've messed up my whole thing, because I'm like, he's like charming and handsome and hilarious, like maybe, like I did this all wrong, but I, what I didn't want was to have an actor come in and like be a funny neurologist and for scientists, like I really wanted scientists to like this movie and I, I didn't want them to be like call bullshit on it basically. So I really wanted her to be like serious and intense because I imagine when you're doing what you do, what you do so serious, you're probably not, you know, trying to entertain people while you're working. But comedians, we can't stop trying to entertain people. So I have gotten migraines my whole life. Um, and, but it's really hard for me to not perform. It's, it's just like the Pavlovian urge. And I got migraines every time I was on camera. And when I have migraines, I, I operate really slow and I stutter and I conflate words. And every time I was on camera, I luckily had a migraine so I couldn't default to my performance trying to be funny thing. So everyone was like, you're so different and this, this is such a different character than you, but it's because like, the universe intervened and my brain just like broke the days I was performing. Interesting.
That's interesting to me, but I don't know. It was, it was a, a weird little, um, the only way that I could play the character in kind of a real grounded way. So just the logistics, how did you do the casting? How did you do the, how did it come Yeah, about? I just kind of asked people, you know, a lot of people responded to that, like a lot of actors wanted to do it, which was really encouraging. And I think a lot of people were excited about it because no one's made a neurology comedy yet. And I think, um, you know, Sofia Vergara right away um, was interested in doing it. Blake Griffin wrote it with him in mind. Um, I, you know, I wrote it with this guy, Neil Brennan, um, who co-created The Chappelle Show. I don't know if you guys know him, really great comedian. He knew Blake Griffin. And he's like, Blake Griffin's funny. And I was like, professional athlete's funny. This is going to go well. <laughs> and uh, he was amazing. Uh, Cecily Strong from Saturday Night Live, I just, I was a fan of hers. And I reached out to her. I was just like hassling people, basically. I'm addicted to my phone, luckily. So I was just constantly emailing and texting until it came together. Was it fun to make the film? No. <laughs> no, it really wasn't. I, you know, I, 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 it was fascinating and it was wonderful, but it was, um, incredibly hard and I put a lot of pressure on myself because I was so afraid of getting it wrong. I was so afraid of this conversation <laughs> and you being like, yeah, that's not the part of the brain and me just like um, crumbling because I, I really wanted to make something special and I hope I did, but I think that, you know, I don't know if you do, do all I see are mistakes when I watch it. I'm like, oh, we should have got that shot and oh, the light was going down, we should have done this. So it's, it's hard for me. To, I think it'll be fun in like a year when I can look back. Like, it's like having a child. Like, the, the first couple years are terrible, right? And then once they can walk and, like, go to the bathroom on their own, like, this isn't so bad. Like, I feel like I'm in that beginning time. Well, you're selling it really well. <laughs> uh, okay. people it's here. just, it's been, you know, I, making a movie. I, I don't know, I guess people are always like, it was amazing, it was so fun, and we, like, we're in Australia. I'm like, no. Um, it was not a glamorous experience. Uh, and I just, I really, I put a lot of pressure on myself to get it right. Let's talk about being a comedian. Yeah. So the, the kind of the premise of this afternoon is timing. Comedians have to do a lot uh, of preparations. And in a way, it's a one-time thing. Because when you tell the joke once yeah. to an audience, if it's funny, it worked. If it didn't, it didn't work. But then you can't tell it again. You can't rehearse the way theater actors That's rehearse. Right. It's like one time. How do That's you prepare right. a comedy show? You know, I think that the preparation has, a lot of it was done. Uh, well, I had a bad childhood, that helped. Uh, <laughs> that's always sort of what, like, you know, the idea of performing in front of people, from what I understand, is like there was a wiring issue at a young age. Because, and please tell me if I'm wrong, um, I was reading you, about you how. Said three times. Because I'm so afraid of I you. I will tell you, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that, um, why, are you guys, for the most part, scared of public speaking? Like by a show of nodding, yeah, scared of public speaking. I was reading about how um, that is an uh, in, instinct because it used to be that when you were speaking in front of a bunch of people, it means you were defending your position against the tribe who was like putting you on trial. If you're facing a bunch of humans, our reptile brain is saying like, they're basically all about to kill me. Interesting. Because, I didn't know yeah, I I that could be true, that could not be true. You'll tell me later. Uh, and uh, I thought that was so fascinating. So it is actually like we're not. <laughs> He's just grading. He's just writing bullshit, bullshit. Um, but we're kind of wired. I think what fascinated me so much about the movie is that um, our brain is wired for tribal times. You know, our brain hasn't evolved to catch up with alarm systems and right stages and museums and um, grocery stores and such. So, um, you know, for me, I, I think I grew up as a performer. I had to work really hard to get attention as a kid, which I do think probably helps a lot. Um, I feel very comfortable um, begging for people to like me, which I think you can't just turn on at 25 or 30. Um, and then I did a lot of work. I did a lot of stand up, getting comfortable on stage. Um, and I think it also helps to like adrenaline because that's what it is ultimately, right? Let's start with the first time. The first time you're on stage, mm -hmm. how old were you? What was the story? How did it happen? I was, I think, 22 years old. Um, everyone was always like, you should do stand-up in a way that was like, please go do stand-up. <laughs> like, go tell these stories to someone else. <laughs> like, we've heard them. Uh, <laughs> like, go yell at strangers, not us. And, uh, and so I finally, it was a t during MySpace. Do you remember my, I used to like my, yeah, he's like, I remember. Um, and I used to like ask people for spots. And then one day I was just, I would go to comedy clubs. I would watch and I was sort of like research and see what they were doing and, um, you know, write constantly, take copious notes about anything that made my friends laugh. And I ultimately put together some time, asked someone to go on. And, and it's common for comedians, the first time they go on to do great, and then to suck for like three years after that, but you're gambling for that one time you did amazing because it's such a rush. 
that you just keep doing it to get back to that first time. Um, you know, which was an interesting time perception thing because you're on stage for 10 minutes and it feels like two seconds. I think that's a lot of times when they say you're meant to be a stand-up, that if you, if you don't feel the clock ticking. Generally, we know that uh, when things seem like they are faster, it means that you're enjoying, that's like a classical thing. Um, who did they talk to about, just this week, I think, I'm trying to remember, but some, I mean, oh, we were here at the Rubin Museum and we had like an experiment on time and someone asked me a question and I said, here's a tip uh, for dating. <laughs> Go on a date with a guy, Maybe she's here. There's like a, a woman who asked me, and she said she's going to come here. Let's see. If you recognize yourself. No, she's with the guy. <laughs> she went on a date. Told her, go on a date to the guy, and as the date begins, let's say you have dinner, look at the time, and count one hour. Like, one hour passes. Then ask him, how long does it think it's been? If he says anything below one hour, you know that he's enjoying the date. If he says anything above one hour, it's not going well. So you can actually uh, figure out like, how it works. Hashtag the female brain. <laughs> It works for men as well. <laughs> that is very manipulative. I like What's that. A, how long, <laughs> how long has this talk been? Um, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's been hours. I, <laughs> I feel like we've been here for five minutes. <laughs> oh, that's It's actually scary. a good way to, uh, uh, so one, one of the studies that a colleague of mine did is basically the reverse version of that. They had people watch a two minute clip, let's say Justin Bieber but they kind of toyed with the clock. So for some people, it, it just said that this was five minutes long. Yeah. And for some, it said it's one minute long. So it's the same clip, it's just like the clock on the YouTube video below seems like it's moving faster or slower. And then you ask people, how, what did you think about the clip? And those who think it was much faster than five minutes think it was amazing. They say, oh, it's a really good clip. And those who think it was much longer think it was much worse. So people actually know that things should, things that are fun take short time. And what's interesting about that is that to simplify it, our brain doesn't have clocks in it. The brain has all kinds of mechanisms to count time, but we don't really have a clock in our brain that you can rely on. You, none of you can say, I'm gonna count now 10 seconds and know that it's gonna actually work. Like your brain kind of knows time by counting memories. <coughs> so what our brain is good at is thinking in memories, and you kind of know that uh, humans our age, uh, between say 20 to 60, create about a memory every one and a half second. So your brain knows that in a day you have to have X amount of memories, and this is how we count time. We say, oh, I have 10 memories, I guess it means 15 seconds. And mm. what's interesting is that those things don't work the same way, A, if you're really, really excited, or if you're really, really bored. So if you have a car accident, people report that when they have a car accident, they slam the brake, and they remember every person that was on the street, every uh, gesture oh, wow. that they had, the facial they, they, Basically, the brain creates a lot of memory that kind of samples the world much faster. You actually remember 200 things from those two seconds. Contrary to that, if you're sitting in count, a counting class, uh, that's the best example I can th think of right now, <laughs> a counting class, uh, time stands still, you create one memory, which is the clock not moving, and that's the, uh, that's the only thing you remember from this class. And that, that's how our brain basically perceives time. It counts memories and knows what it is. So you can ask questions about memories of people or about time and know what it is. And what's interesting is that memories, now we talk about the female and male brain, there are differences in the, main, in the male brain and the female brain in which mechanisms actually count time. And for female brains, what drives the clocks is mostly the part of the brain that has to do with emotions. So they uh, remember a lot more moments that were emotional than men. Most of you probably remember where you were on 9-11, because this is an amplified emotion. For all of you, it created a memory, but men in the room would remember less events that had to do with memories than women. So if, if we can say something funny, it immediately creates an emotion, you're gonna remember this moment, and you can actually know how long it was by how many jokes you just heard. That's how women in the room is gonna remember that, and men would be less accurate on that. They'll remember based on how big my boobs are. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, is that have something to do with <laughs> I'm a scientist now. Is there something to do with adrenaline, with remembering when something traumatic happens? You, it sticks in your brain more to, for survival mechanisms? So generally, uh, bad, so both men and women tend to remember more bad things than good things. This is how our brain works. Mm -hmm. uh, and adrenaline usually ties to, it's amplified when things are stressful and they require 
uh, the first one require a little bit more kind of awareness. It controls, it basically amplifies, it's kind of fueled all the system. So adrenaline is there when things are bad because it requires a lot of fuel or when things are extremely good because it requires a lot of processing. But either way, usually bad things get a lot more memory because of that. Um, generally, humans' brains, kind of if you think about evolution, going back to what you said about the womb, uh, you know, we know that we, the brain is the only mechanism that nature gave us to adapt to reality. So everything else in our body is written in our code when we were born. Your eye color is already written when you are born. Your height is already written when you are born. The only thing that nature gave us to adapt to the world is our brain. It's the only thing that keeps changing after we are born. And in many ways, this is the tool that we have to kind of respond to changes in the environment. But at the same time, what's recently known is that our brain actually carries components of the past in it. So genetics of your parents and your grandparents are actually in your brain. And you have something that you're born with. So a baby that's born, that the famous study on monkeys shows that a baby monkey is born on day one. You show the monkey a picture of a snake and the monkey gets scared. Now this monkey has never seen snakes in his mm -hmm. life. He doesn't know anything about snakes. He doesn't know anything about what's scary about them. But in his brain already sits this mechanism that says, be scared of snakes, they're bad for you. And this comes from his mom and from his grandmother all were actually bitten by snakes and had bad experiences with them, coded this in their brain and moved it along. The interesting anecdote that I should end with and then go back to our conversation, <laughs> I immediately go to lecture mode. I love uh, it. <laughs> love it so much. This is like, if, if time took very long, then you know that I'm really boring. This is the only free <laughs> education in America. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we know, interestingly, that we didn't know before is that for the first time in history, uh, we, our generation, is actually reversing this uh, mechanism uh, negatively. What I mean by that is that uh, if you think of, how many of you have done a VR experience? Like went and put the goggles on VR? Great, so Not there's enough of you to know it. So one of the things that, they, one of the things that I did a few months ago uh, to kind of see how VR works, I put the v virtual reality goggles and I played this thing where you stand on top of a building and they tell you, jump off the building. They tell you, make a step and you kind of fall off the building. Now, everything in your body screams, don't do that. You actually feel the fear of about to fall down from the building, but then if you make this thing, you feel brave and courageous. You just made something that was kind of scary for your brain. At that moment, you actually changed your brain forever. So our brains were carry in them the fear of heights. Every person in the room, whether you actually are suffering from fear of heights or just have a slight fear of heights, you will exhibit the symptoms of fear if I put you in the top of a cliff. Your heart is gonna race, your pupils are gonna dilate, your uh, skin is gonna be a little more conductive. Things are gonna happen to you that indicate that you're scared. And that's because back thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, uh, your ancestors stood at the top of the cliff. One of them looked down and fell, didn't get to have kids. The other one didn't look down, did not fall, got to have kids. You're the kids, the descendants of the people who were scared of heights. And that's why in your brain you have fear of heights. Once you put the VR goggles and you actually step out of the cliff and you don't fall and, you fall and nothing happens, your brain learns now that, oh, it's not that scary. And this means that from that moment on, your brain now has a component that didn't exist ever before, which is no fear of heights, and you're gonna pass it to your kids. So our generation, because of VR, learns to not be afraid of things that you're supposed to be afraid of, and wow. you're gonna carry it in your brain and you're gonna pass it forward. So for the first time in history, we can actually change evolution, this time negatively, in taking over a fear and making it not be there, Negatively. This was too. That's minutes, what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth. This was two minutes, two yeah, two and a half minutes of me talking right now. If you, uh, <laughs> you know how interesting. Felt talking. like two seconds. <laughs> Um, that is, yeah, that, I mean, that is kind of like the conceit, I think, of the movie in a lot of ways for me is like everything that annoys you about your wife or girlfriend or husband or boyfriend today probably would have saved your life 2,000 years ago. So just have some <laughs> patience, you know, like guys get, you know, like when a guy's like phone goes off and I'm like, who's that? Like, that's annoying now. It seems like I'm a jealous, possessive, crazy person. But 2,000 years ago, that would have been like, oh, there's a lion. Let's run. You know, so I, I'm sorry I'm a superhero, but stop yelling at me. <laughs> so I just feel like we have all these amazing superpowers that we just kind of don't really need anymore, and they're translating into tension in relationships, you know? So it really is about how, you know, our primordial instincts sabotage our modern day relationships. So you, inter interesting point that you raised that I wanna know. How yes. did making the film change your perception of men? 
Uh, honestly, I, it, it, I think it has been so therapeutic for me because it helped me understand there's a biological basis for everyone's behavior. So not just guys I've dated or um, men in my family, because I've also learned a lot about epigenetic imprinting and that my dad and my grandfather, they carry some really primal like Viking shit in <laughs> them, you know? Um, it's helped me to have so much more patience for sort of like the biological basis for like checking out a girl that walks by. The way that the... Um, uh, author of the book described it as a guy, because it used to hurt my feelings. If a guy that I'm dating checks out a girl that walks by, she equated it with like, it's like if I were to see like a butterfly. It's not like he's in love with her. It's not like he wants to leave me for her. It's just like a, it's a tick. And guess what? I'm doing it too for different reasons. But it helped me to have just sort of more of a, um, help me to be more humble and to take things less personally and stop internalizing everybody's behavior. So it's like my boss is yelling at me or someone's yelling at me. Now I'm not like, I'm a terrible person, I failed. I'm like, oh, his amygdala is activated. Let me just give him a couple days, you know? So I, 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 it's really helped me to just um, not take everything so personally. Did people on the set talk about that? Like people, the actors, did you spend time talking about the science of things? What I didn't involve the actors in it because I didn't want them to overthink it the way I do. I didn't want, I just wanted them to be very natural and very real and to not have to worry about, because we don't think about this kind of stuff very often, so I didn't want the actors to be bogged down in all the science of it. Like, I did have to get shots because in the movie we freeze frame on them and then we put an x-ray and we go inside of their brain, so I did have to make them sort of artificially turn certain ways so we could get camera angles, but I didn't really want to involve them in a lot of that stuff because I didn't want them to be thinking about it. There's also a book that Lou and the scientist behind it, wrote about the male brain. Is there a sequel coming? Um, <laughs> um, every time this comes up, people make sexist jokes, and I'm not going to. Uh, I think she's also writing the transgender brain right now, yeah. which I'm fascinated uh, to read. Um, I don't think, I, we'll see how this does. I mean, this movie actually was male and female. That we just kept the female brain because it was the name of the book. But it's equally male and female in this one, so I don't think we really need another one. Hopefully. If I didn't cover it in this, I'm done. I'm tired. Um, but yeah, don't you think that we covered both? Yeah, I think, I, think, I, mean, I think the movie is called The Female Brain, and I think it's going to seem like it's about that. But actually, from my experience, it uh, both talks about men and women. Also, if every time you talk about the female brain and you say, female brain has, I don't know, a bigger amygdala, it means that the, main brain, the male brain has smaller amygdala. So you kind of get the... You get the By default, yeah. yeah. And I mean, there was just so many things in it that I felt like um, were... It's a very, I think, pro both sexes movie. And like, uh, there's a storyline about how um, women are better at reading facial expressions than men are. Um, and so I've now stopped asking men to read my mind all the time when someone's like, how are you? And I'm like, I'm good. And they're like, great. And I'm like, how did you know that that's not what I meant? You know, how could you think I'm fine? I just was like, I'm fine. Like, I now am like... You know, it's helped me to be more communicative and more responsible in my communication and much more direct. Because my girlfriends do know that when I say, I'm fine, that I'm not, <laughs> but the men in my life don't. So I've, I've, it's, it's caused me to really change my behavior in the workplace and in my relationships. At least in this room, everyone now knows. So. Everybody, you guys now know that everything I say, it's basically it means I feel the opposite. So just <laughs> never take me at face value. <laughs> so I want to tie talking about stand-up comedy and the film to the current climate. So right now, there's a lot of like, difficulty for comedians to talk about things. There's, uh, there's a lot of things you can't joke about anymore. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, heightened uh, kind of fear I think, yeah. among comedians. How do you do that? That's a really great point. I think, I mean, you guys have, have seen the news, I'm sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a scary time. And there's a, 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 it's a, you know, and I also think that there's um, a weird craving for positivity and facts. Um, you know, a lot of, we look at our news and you, it's like, this could be true. You know, we're in this weird <laughs> fake news time where a lot, we don't trust our news. Like that is such an insane concept to me. So I think there's a lot of relief around like, okay, that's science. A scientist says it's true, so it's true. So that's kind of where I'm staying right now in what I talk about because I think that's what people want to hear. You know, I, because right now every talk show, all the new constantly, it's Trump, 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 Trump. When you go to a comedy club, the last thing you want to hear is Trump, 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 Trump. You know, I think there's this craving for positivity. I just did um, the new Roseanne reboot. I don't know, did anyone watch Roseanne growing up? Show of noise. Yeah, a couple of people. 
there's also, I think, a craving for nostalgia right now. You know, I think people are like weirded out by what's going on and the idea of just seeing that iconic couch and those people that we used to watch in more innocent times, it's just like a relief, you know? It's like an emotional hug. So um, it is harder to talk about things when you go on stage and say like, so Trump, people recoil. They're like, oh God, like I have to still listen to that. No one wants to hear about it. Comedians used to be the people who, the only people who could make fun of the president of the United States. And now I think people, you know, everyone does. Uh, so comedians have to, I think, fly even higher and talk about. So is there things you won't joke about? There's things I won't joke about because either other people are better at it. Like right now, the talk shows that are on, whether it's John Oliver and Kimmel and Colbert and Samantha Bee, there's so many people, and especially with our news cycle, how quickly um, comedians are. It used to be like you could do a special a year and you could talk about politics, but they're talking about it every night. So by the time you shoot a special and it comes out, it all feels old. It's all already been done. So. I try to talk about super evergreen stuff that's still gonna be fresh in a couple of years. Um, I don't really talk about politics a ton because it's just, we were talking about this earlier, it's too, I have to live whatever I'm talking about on stage. I have to live it and talk about it every night. And I really try to play defense. I mean, I don't know if you guys do this, but we, me and my friends, we have rules now when we go to dinner, like no Trump. We're not allowed to talk about, like you have to set boundaries now because you'll just get in fights and people are storming out and everyone's pissed off. And so I, I just personally don't want to talk about it every night because it's too <laughs> exhausting for me. Um, so I, I stay away from politics. And there are people who are very good at it and I'm like, you go for it. That's not my skill. I'm, I'm super obsessed with relationships and how you know the internet, internet porn is affecting our sex lives. That's, that's what I'm obsessed with. Are you okay? Are you good? Um, that's just what keeps me up at night. Stuff like what you were talking. <sighs> Let us know you're okay. I'm a female brain. I'm obsessed. I want to like help her. Um, that's what keeps me up at night. Like, is porn ruining our? Or is video games ruining our children? That's just what I'm obsessed with. You know. So that's what I. I just try to talk about what I'm passionate about, or else you'll you'll go crazy. I want to say that I also cared about her. I. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. <laughs> I believe you. Should we just go help that lady together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're much better qualified than I am. I'm looking at the time to, to make sure. So we're going to, uh, in a second, open it for the audience to uh, ask questions, so prepare for that. But now I wanted to ask you, kind of before we go to the audience, the movie's coming out tomorrow. Yeah. Where are you going to be tomorrow in, say, 24 hours from now when this thing happens? I, well, we do, oh no, she caught it. <laughs> tomorrow I go back to Los Angeles. I will be in LA. There's, you know, it's, it's playing in LA tomorrow night, so I'll be doing Q and A's tomorrow night in Los Angeles. I'll be kind of doing the same thing with someone way less intelligent than you. I don't think we have okay. neuroscientists in Los Angeles. <laughs> I, went, I went to school there. The, oh, there hey. one. okay, so you used to be there, yeah. So yeah. there's no more left. I took, it every, I took everything with me, scorched earth, nothing there. Right, right. Yes. So, but I, um, I, I will probably, to answer your question in a more honest way, I will probably be trying to not go on the internet and seek out like negative feedback. That, that's kind of, I think, what being in entertainment sort of is now, is like when something big happens to you, the temptation is to go onto Twitter and see what everybody's saying, but you can really hurt yourself with that stuff. So I'm just going to be- Does it really affect you? Like you keep, like yes, you... definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think comedians, we're wired for approval, as gross as that sounds. We want people to like what we do. We want to make people laugh. And if you don't, you feel like you're failing. And I think we, I tend to amplify the negative. Is that a thing that we amplify? Humans do, but women more. Yeah, god damn it. Um, so yeah, I think that you know you look at your comments and you have 10 great ones and then one that's mediocre and that's the only one I can focus on. I ignore all the compliments and focus on the negatives. You so, know. so you're not alone. Most people have this uh, loss aversion. Like the, you look at, you know. Loss you aversion, is that what it's called? That's one name that, that uh, yes. is part of like, the, the, the Nobel Prize given to the guys who discovered that to basically show that uh, if you lose a dollar and then you make a dollar and you go back to zero, you still feel bad because you focus on the, and oh, you wow. need to make about four dollars to actually balance that. So if you lose one and you make four, oh, sorry, make five. So if you, get to, you, you lose one, you get back to four dollars by making five dollars. It's was complicated, but you got me. This is how much <laughs> I made for the movie, five dollars. So it's actually a very good metaphor. So, so this, this will balance that, but it's really, really, and, and here they, they did one study, it's kind of a, a survey, they asked people questions about like their loss of version experience and women tend to, 
need even more to yeah. kind of go back to normal. And my brain goes like, someone's like, the movie was really good. And I'm like, it wasn't great, it was really good. You know, like I just get in the weeds <laughs> on that, and then I gotta go to their profile, and I'm like, who's this asshole? And I'm like, okay. And then I get into his, and I'm like, oh, he's got a wife, she doesn't look happy in that, but like I get. <laughs> into like a wormhole, oh, 20 followers, okay. Like, I, I knew it. Like, it's, it gets, it's an addiction, really, ultimately. How about you make a, is there, a, what's the way to promote a movie? Like, you just like it on the, so you have, you have an audience here, make it like, let's get a deal right now. Oh, Everyone gosh. Everyone here, like, uh, like them, I don't know, how, how do you do it? Like, you like on Facebook? You, you, I think that movies now, it becomes like a word of mouth thing, is if people like it, they'll talk friends. about it, they'll tweet about it. You can't make someone do something they don't want to do. I was reading this, thing, because I'm a scientist now, uh, <laughs> about what is going on and how bifurcated our country is. Like, if, if, if you say the sky is blue, well, you're you, so you're sane, it but is. if someone says, like, this, <laughs> if, you, if you say the sky is green, and I go, it's blue, you actually believe your point more strongly when someone right out tells you that you're wrong? Because, uh, yeah, there, there, there are kind of a couple of studies on that that show that we become immune to facts when we have a belief, and when someone gives us fact that contradicts ours, we don't take it in, but we actually find flaws in this person. So if you like iPhone, and I show you 10 different arguments why Samsung is better, you will think that I'm an idiot. Like you would not even listen to, like you would stop listening. Does that explain everything that's going on right now, or what? <laughs> like why isn't that the front page of every newspaper, that piece of information? It I'll explains... tell you what's interesting, uh, that now, now the science that's to me even more interesting is the fact that uh, we rarely challenge our own brain. And that's, I think, the next level of complication, which is, uh, so, you know, you're sitting with me right now, and we're both here. Let's say tomorrow someone tells you, Whitney, it was so great that we had dinner last night. And you say, no, no, last night I was with a scientist in a museum. They say, no, no, you were with me. They say, no, I remember that I was with this scientist in the museum. And then the guy pulled a picture of the two of you having dinner. He said, this is weird. I'm sure I was at this museum. And then he brings 10 other people who say, yeah, we all were there, dinner, it will take a lot of time before you actually will say, you know what, I don't know that I actually were at the museum because you showed me so much evidence. And that is because our brain is geared to believe its own memories. But what we learn more and more is that that's not really reliable. Our memories are not as accurate as we think they are. And there is a chance that, you're gonna, that I can change your memories and create a new narrative for you. And you will really, really find it hard to challenge your own memories. You will challenge everyone else's inputs on the outside, but your own memories you trust. There's a, kind of a t-shirt that my students made once that I love that says, don't believe everything you think. Oh, wow. Which is, a, a, which is something that's really hard for us. We kind of, there's like one barrier, which is our brain, which we always trust. And that's apparently not a reliable source as well. Do you remember, that? did anyone see that making of a murderer where those guys convinced a kid that he killed someone? Mm -hmm. Like you just watched them slowly gaslight him into just doubting his own... The woman who got very, very famous for that, Elizabeth Loftus, she's a professor at Irvine, at UC Irvine in California, she, her kind of most famous experiment was one where she brought kids to the lab, and before the kid shows up, she talks to the kid's parents, and she asks the parents facts about the kid. So then the kid shows up, and then she says, okay, your parents talked to me, and they told me that uh, when you were three years old, you played in the field, and you got injured, Tell me about that, and the kid tells a story about that, and then she says, the parents also told me that uh, when you were uh, six, you started to write, and you did a good job in writing and reading, and tell me about that, and, and she asks a few questions, and then she asks about one thing. She says, at some point when you were seven, you went to the shopping mall with your parents, and you were lost, and they had to find you, and it took some time to find you, and you were very nervous, and you cried, and this, tell me about that. And what actually happens is that the first stories are all true, the parents told, but the fifth one, the one on the shopping mall, is made up. She just mixed up. And everyone, because they have evidence for the other stories being true, oh, they just wow. go with it. And they say, yeah, I remember I was uh, seven, it was uh, the shopping mall, it was this. And they tell a story. And then she brings this kid back a week after and she says, let's, let's talk about it more. And she asks more questions about this thing and the kid starts visualizing it and having, she asks him to draw a map of the place and they draw a map. Like they really, really have more and more narrative behind something that was totally made up. And when she comes to the kid week number four and says, this was not true, it was all made up. People defend this Oh up story. my gosh. Every relationship I've ever been in. <laughs> this explains everything. Yes, it explains everything. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, stay with us a little longer and we're going to you know, solve everything for you. Yeah, so thank the, you. That's, that's this is like terrifying. Public therapy. This is that is, is terrifying. And then I was reading something, I mean, especially comedian, like when you get a certain reaction out of someone, you start embellishing that part of the story and your memory starts to kind of change. I mean, I, I, to make it optimistic a little bit, we should say that this is uh, our brain's way of healing. 
So the fact that our brain changes memories is part of the beauty of nature mm -hmm. that allows us to actually take bad experiences and over time reframe them and make them good. So your boyfriend broke up with you and you're feeling what? awful. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, uh, that's, I don't blame him. <laughs> that's how we're supposed to tell um, <laughs> This is how he's telling me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is very <laughs> sick. <laughs> So you're feeling really de depressed and you go to your therapist and the therapist says, tell me what happened. And you say, well, my boyfriend broke up with me. And basically by telling the story, you load the memory. And now you kind of put it out there and it's floating and it's vulnerable. And vulnerable in the sense that now the therapist can actually say something and this leaks into the memory. So she might say, you know, yes, he broke up with you, but uh, you told me many times that you don't really feel satisfied in this relationship, so maybe it's not good for you. And in doing that, she actually injected a new idea into the memory. And then when you leave the therapist, you save it but you save the modified memory. You save the memory with the new information. Mm. Then you come back a week after and she asks you again, tell me about the breakup, and you now load the modified version. You load, you load the version that's already changed, and you tell a different story now. And then she puts a new piece of information, and then you save it again, and after six meetings, you actually keep changing the memory. This is what our brain is made for. It's made to help us get better by injecting new ideas into memories, and so doing that makes them change. So it's actually a good mechanism for us. It's okay, you're still together. Well, <laughs> no, I love kids. It's, this is actually something funny. It's, it, it's just sort of a funny memory thing that I love. I, everybody's dying in here. Um, uh, I was working with this writer who's been, I don't know, has anyone been in a relationship for more than like 10, 12 years? Anyone? How long? 30 years. That's, what's your secret? Bad memories. What is it? Endurance. Endurance. <laughs> So I know someone who's been married for 20 years, and he's married to this wonderful woman who's really funny, and um, and he's very funny as well, but she's more the performer, and they go to these dinner parties, and one time they're at dinner and um, with a bunch of people, and she's telling this amazing story, and she was mugged in Amsterdam, and she had to fight this mugger, and then this homeless guy, and she's like telling the story, everybody's laughing, everybody's laughing, and he's like seething, and they get in the car, and she, he's like, what the hell was that? And she's like, what do you mean? He's like, that didn't happen to you, that happened to me. <laughs> You're telling my story. She's like, no, it didn't, that happened to me. He's like, no, it did it <laughs> like how do you not remember that that's not your story and she she had just heard it so many times that she actually thought it had happened to her it happens often i'm sure it happens to you uh, uh, more than you know your brains just meld at a certain point <laughs>